Oh, um, Kira Koko. Um, I'm Sue Bradford, and I've um, just finished a PhD. In, in part, this is just a very quick summary of some of the findings. Um, with Kira to all the students here that are still doing their PhDs, <laughs> it's quite a journey. Um, and before I go any further, I also get, try and give a very nutshell autobiography because some people in this room know me quite well, but other people might not know anything about me. Um, I've been a radical left street activist since I was 15. I've been part of um, two major waves of student mobilisation and I've been back at university twice, once when I started in, in the anti-Vietnam War movement days and the early the first part of the first women's liberation and gay liberation groups on Auckland University campus. Later on I was back at uni doing my masters in Chinese language, um, completely irrelevant to my PhD. Um, and I was caught up in the 81 mobilisation against the Springbok tour and so that was a second huge wave, wave, uh, wave of student activism. Um, from 1983 to 1999 I went to the Unemployed Workers and Beneficiaries Movement, both locally and nationally, based in Auckland. Um, and, and quite a, um, some of you will know the word prefigurative, um, and quite a prefigurative as well as a resistance way in that we started setting up our own organisations, including three people centres in Auckland, that we start to build our own people's bases inside a rotten system. Um, and then in 1999 I went to Parliament for 10 years as a Member of Parliament for the Green Party and left in um, 2009. Uh, quite uh, one of those great defeats that um, Campbell was talking about. I've been defeated many, many times. Go on, Sue, keep going. I keep going. Yeah. Um, and so I had a, that was one of the worst defeats I ever had because um, losing the co-leadership struggled in the Green Party made me realise it wasn't so much the personal defeat, which of course I went in with my eyes open to that, um, but that I saw the ground of the Green Party moving so far to the right and in the neoliberal direction that Russell Norman has so exposed this week, that's why I couldn't help but pull it out regularly. Um, he does understand capitalism and he knows what he's doing. Um, and so that's why I, I tried to stay, but I couldn't. I came out very depressed about the future of the left and then thought, okay, what do I do now? And ended up doing a PhD with Marilyn Zering at AUT in public policy. Um, so, that's where, and, so that's where I start this. Um, so that's what I'm going to cover. I won't dwell on that because we're short of time. Um, the topic of um, my thesis was this, my question. A major left-wing think tank in Aotearoa, an impossible dream or a call to action. And I genuinely did not know the answer to that question. Very unusual, I think, to have a thesis question that is just yes, no. Um, and some people critique me. But strangely, through the whole three years, it remained the question. Because I seriously did not know the answer, and that's why I was doing the research. <coughs> Um, I was driven to that question by the fact that no major left-wing think tank has ever emerged in this country, even though we've had um, a number of right-wing and centre think tanks. Um, when I started the PhD, I identified as an activist, not as an academic at all. Um, I've been involved in the group Nadia talked about, or Connection Against Poverty, since it started in 2010. I was one of the people who helped set it up, and I've been very involved ever since. I'm also involved in a group called Kotari, which is Research and Education for Social Change in Aotearoa Trust, based up near Gosford. Um, and for three years of this period, I was um, in the MANA, I played, played um, quite an active role in the MANA party, no longer. And, um, by the time I submitted my thesis in February of this year, I finally, it took just right at the end of the thesis generally, I suddenly found myself shifting into academic mode. And the day after I submitted, I started work as a full-time lecturer at Unity, which is where I'm at now. So the aim of my research was to find out why no think tank on the left had developed. Did the state of the left in the research period 2010 to 2013 provide fertile ground for that or not? What might such an entity look like? And then finally, what could we learn from nascent think tanks, and that's groups that are like think tanks but aren't in the full form of it, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a sec. Um, of course, in doing, you will know this, but in academic types, that definitions are critical. This one thing, try, how many people here have tried to write an academic definition of left? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure more than that. It took me at least three months to write one sentence. 
because I started going the byways and highways of the theoretical lift that um, Kemble and others and um, Warwick T and other people are such experts in and I'm not. And it was so exciting to start to read what was happening internationally and then I realised I was going down so many rabbit holes, I just had to stop reading theory, which was quite sad because I really enjoyed it. Um, and come right back and try and find a definition for now in Aotearoa, that's it. Anyway, um, we won't dwell on the definition of left. Some of you may be highly critical of it, and I'm highly critical of it myself, but it was designed to appease or please um, the left right across from the social democratic, like the centre Labour really, the Greens, and right through to the transform transformative left, anarchist, socialist, communist left. Um, so in trying to keep make a definition that worked for all that, for all the left across that, um, many people on the radical left find this quite inadequate, including myself. But it was formed for the purpose of this thesis only. The second definition that was critical was think tank. Um, and there's a, again a vast academic literature on th think tanks and I was only talking about one kind of think tank, something that might be set up in reality that I could conceive of being set up in reality in Aotearoa from a community-based, union-based, not-for-profit um, basis, not totally inside a university, not funded by government, not transnational and not church-based. Um, so something that some of us could possibly do ourselves. So it was framed inside that. But across all sectors, like uh, right across issues and sectors. <coughs> and that, um, there's a strong historical <coughs> irony um, that Chris Trotter, I thought, just defined quite well, but that the right, um, right through the last few decades, and we can see it so clearly, has understood Gramsci much and used the Gramsci and notions of hegemony and intellectual hegemony and the intellectual ammunition much, much more effectively and more strongly than the left has all over the Western world. Um, and it's such an irony that it's the right that gets that Gramsci and notion so strongly and we don't so much. Um, as some of my fellow, uh, I still think of myself as a PhD student, but I'm not anymore. But you can see how close, I've only just graduated. Um, in putting a PhD together, I, for the first time, had to start working with sociological methodologies. Um, I'd, done, I'd been involved in past participatory action research before, um, but this wasn't applicable for this project because there was no existing group or groups or people to work with, like there was no group to be participatory with. And I won't go through why I rejected all these, but the whole methodological journey was absolutely fascinating. Um, and these were the five, I ended up going through five of them and finding that um, none of them would work. And one of them, of course, was social movement theory, which was what triggered me to come here. Um, I tried to avoid social movement theory, but I found that I couldn't. <laughs> because actually a big part of what I was doing was what is called in the literature social movement about social movement knowledge production. That is the knowledge and research and education that's done by social movements themselves. The work of think tank like community based organisations, my nascent left wing think tanks. And also, of course, it was very much grounded in the activist world of Aotearoa, which, again, social movement research is research. So I just, whichever way I turned, I couldn't have would it. Um, just for interest, those are the seven groups, the main groups I um, researched or looked at. You may or may not be familiar with all of them. This was the mother group I was involved in back in the 80s and 90s which started off as a simple unemployed workers' rights centre, very similar to what Auckland Action Against Poverty is now, but went on to do many, many other things. <clears throat> CPEG is probably the most effective of those groups at the moment. Um, in terms of method, I interviewed 51 academics and activists across the left from all over the country. There were many, many more people I would have liked to have interviewed, including some, some of you in this room that I didn't get to. Um, but of course, anyone that understands about um, semi-structured interviews at this level, each one is a very intense process. I transcribed nearly all of them myself, and 51 was actually a huge number. 
um, and gave, I think, quite a good sample across the left. Um, yeah, across the left. So I was deeply within the social movement world if you use that lens. So why I rejected social movement theory and why I said, oh, I've got to come to this conference, because I, I've never been part of a conscious social movement, even though I've been in a lifetime of activism. When I started to read the social movement literature, I saw, okay, they talk about the anti-Vietnam War movement, they talk about gay liberation, they talk about women's lib, they talk about the Springbok tour. These are all great social movements. Oh, we never thought of ourselves as social movements. And the, move, and the word movement itself is quite contestable for people like me as well. Um, and then Sandra Gray, I saw had written, great social movement theorist, had written about even the movement, the more recent one, the 80s and 90s, what she called the anti-poverty movement. Ah, we never saw ourselves as that. How dare they? How dare they? And um, I'd just always seen this language of social movements as so academic and so unrelated. Social movement theorists never came to our groups and worked with us. There was never, never a connection, and it just seemed totally irrelevant. Then the more I started, to, and I only started to read this literature, um, I found that actually in the literature, of course, there are many social movement theories who make, theorists who make the same arguments I was making, that it's not grounded in the real work, it's not serving the purpose of the real work. Um, but nevertheless, the gap seemed to be quite huge. And my anger, it really made me viscerally angry um, that so much work was being done, done about social movements, including in this country, but none of it came back to any groups that I was involved in. So what's going on here? And my anger at that meant that that was one of the reasons I just couldn't bear to use it as, a, as the methodological framework of my thesis, though I tried to avoid it. <laughs> Instead, I used um, a, a methodology that, as far as I know, has never been used at, at this level or at other levels in Aotearoa before. Um, if, has anyone heard of political activist ethnography? Cool. Oh, oh kia ora. I, I know nothing about it, except that I've seen it. You've seen it. <laughs> I know the paper, though I've not read it. I've got it sitting on my desktop. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, really exciting. Once I found I it, it felt perfect. I finally got to something. It was so still within critical inquiry paradigm, which is the natural the place to be for me. Um, also that it was highly reflexive. Um, ethnography fit with, I kept, with, with what I was doing, um, which I, I had kept a thesis journal of observations and reflections throughout the three-year period, and that kind of fieldwork diary is, is key to ethnography, as well as the interviews. Um, and then I got really interested, there's a whole lot of activist ethnographical um, diff different forms of it emerging, and I got really interested in that, and so that ended up, and I won't dwell on that, but Laura Bassion. Uh, one of the key things about um, political activist ethnography actually is that it comes from within the activist groups themselves, so there's not the separation that, there is, how, that I felt is there with social movement theory, rightly or wrongly, um, and that also one of the purposes of PAE is to actually come out of your research with something that's useful for the groups that you're working with, which is what I wanted. This whole project for me was actually could be seen as an action research project, because in effect, it was three years of research. It wasn't about me getting a PhD. I'm far too old, far too old to really worry about that. But it was about using this time of research. Um, it was like a feasibility study for a left-wing think tank. And it was about looking at the state of the left in quite a um, focused way that I don't think has been done much, if ever. Dylan Taylor's master's thesis was the only thing I could find, anything within my time frame that was even remotely um, in this territory. Kia ora, Dylan, because um, I would have felt really lonely if you hadn't done that work. <laughs> um, so reflecting back on social movement theory, um, having finished, um, it's so entrenched that you can't avoid it if you're in the zone. You have to, you have to deal with it. Um, I still harbour um, anger at that disconnect between theory and practice. But then a wonderful thing happened. I invited Sandra Gray here, um, who I... Um, oh, you don't mind me saying you were one of the participants in no, my research? No. Kia ora. <laughs> great. One of my many fantastic participants made a great contribution. Um, and because I'd met Sandra um, a couple of times through that and through a couple of other things, um, I invited um, Sandra up to, 
to be part of our three-day workshop, our winter school at Kotari, which is community-based uh, knowledge production, last weekend, and um, suddenly having a social movement theorist for the first time sitting in the room with us and debating and, oh, okay, we can do this. We can start to cross these boundaries if, if we take that step. And so we were the community, most of us, student, unemployed, union, other activists sitting there with, with a few, it wasn't just Sandra and me, there were a few other academics there, you know, sitting in the room together, and here we are in the room again. So any chance to start to do this work across academic and activist methodological lines, I think is so exciting. Yes, Kia ora, Sandra, for coming. So I called, she came. Or other do workshops we might be. <laughs> So I'm going to very just running right out of time, but I'm going Sorry. to. Why well, there are many, many findings in my thesis, at, and you're all welcome to read it. It's online, but I'll just go through a few that I think are particularly relevant to this workshop. In the area of academic and activist relationships, um, it was clear that for many people, the old dividing lines, separation between activists in the academy remain, that anti-intellectualism that's been talked about for generations in this country, there's still, still some of that about, but that sense of, of elitism from, from the outside, seeing the academy as elite, and that they just do research with no obligation to us on the outside. Um, from academics themselves as well as activists, the very message none of you need to be told about, the huge right-wing influence in the neoliberal academy. Um, very strong. Now I'm working right inside it. I know it, beginning to know it quite <laughs> intimately. Having just finished my first PBRF, oh. <laughs> filling in the form. Oh my God. Anyway, <laughs> um, they are very strongly from people on outside the academy that sense the anger there about being researched. Um, some people um, I interviewed had from the community sector just felt they'd been researched over and over and over again by people, by university researchers. Um, what do they get back from that? Nothing. And, there, and there's this huge resource envy. How dare they come and keep interviewing us, taking our knowledge, our experience of our years of working on the ground, um, that theoretical things that Campbell was talking about, you know, that, that's our practice. Um, and, and they come and they research us and what what do we get back? They have the huge salaries, well seen as huge often isn't, but you know th there's a lot of resource envy from outside the academy. And from inside, um, Susan St John from CPEG, Auckland University Business School, um, she talked about a fear of the loss of academic purity if you do academic work for an advocacy group. And some of you maybe have that from the other side, that if you're involved in community-based advocacy, some of your f colleagues start to think that you're less um, worthy, that your work is um, undermined by that. And that, so that's an issue for people inside the academy. In terms of the nascent left-wing think tanks, those seven groups that I talked about, um, for any group that might go forward um, implementing or setting up a major left-wing think tank or trying to, um, there's a lot that can be learned from the histories of those groups. But some of the key things are um, the crucial role of individuals who take the lead role and champion the project, start, push, keep it going. Without that, nothing happens. Um, secondly, the important that of fun, every every group has to mobilise resources, otherwise things don't happen. Whatever we think about money, you actually have to have some. And the importance of aligning funding sources with the kaupapa of the group and always sticking with that kaupapa and not getting lost, not getting colonised by the funding sources. Um, thirdly, that um, the quality of the work, whatever your work is, whether it's providing services to beneficiaries or whether it's doing, high, doing research, or education, which is more the area of a think tank, whatever you're doing, the quality of the work is hugely important. Um, even more so, there's that sense that even more so when you're on the left, because you're so exposed to hypercriticism from, from the whole upside of any work you do. So the quality of work, quality of work has to be really high. And fourthly, that um, keeping groups, setting groups up and keeping them going is impossible without a skilled core of people capable of, of long-term governance and operational, um, uh, of holding a group together, often in situations where you're really starved of money. So those are some of the 
That's how groups keep going. How many, does some of you know about Ezzy Chaudhry? He was a really well-known activist in Christchurch in the 1990s in the anti-globalisation um, and anti-free trade movements. He's now a um, social movement scholar in Canada, but he's done a lot of work in this area of social movement knowledge production. So I loved coming, because I knew him as an activist, and coming back and seeing his whole academic career has been in this whole area of, of learning from the sort of groups that he comes from and I come from and a lot of you come from, like learning from our knowledge and experience and taking it out and building on it. So I really like this quote from him. And this is a bit, not just in social movement research, but in other research that the academics and others often don't understand how significant it is. And activists themselves don't understand it. How important it is to that it's the long haul that matters the careful long haul of building organisation, um, which is just so unseen, but without which nothing changes. Um, this turned into actually the biggest part of my thesis, was looking at the state of the left. This became much... I'd started off with a think tank as the key question, but in fact the state of the left kind of overtook this took it because it was so huge, <laughs> I suddenly realised with horror, the hugeness, as I think you do when you're a PhD student, with horror, the f the, how big it was what I'd taken on. The state of the left, okay. <laughs> Across all the left, hmm. Anyway, some of the main conclusions from this, um, for a lot of people, that sense of demoralisation, simply we've lost. I'm depressed, I'm lo we're lost. We lost it. We're done in the face of this overpowering um, neoliberal agenda we're up against, capitalist agenda we're up against. Um, the community sector demoralised and colonised, as um, people like Sandra and others have done a lot of research on, but it's so true, wherever you go, this is, and it's just getting worse and worse. Unions are weak, and I interviewed quite a few people from trade unions, um, and this is no disrespect to unions, it's how unionists themselves feel about it. Um, the left is still fractionated, including among Māori. I um, interviewed some of my participants who were Māori, and so they talk quite a lot about divisions inside to Ao Māori, um, you know, particularly the corporate elites, the corporatisation in that world. Um, this was a big theme to come through about mindless activism, and that was in part, there's a whole little section of the thesis on Occupy, which happened during this time, um, and, but it wasn't just about Occupy, but activism that's not thought through and strategic. Um, and then with the parliamentary parties moving to the centre and right, that was a common perception. Of course, not everyone felt that way because some of them were from Labour and the Greens. <laughs> some of them quite happy with where they were. <laughs> So the implications of those negative factors was a reduction overall, a reduction in the confidence of people on the left. Um, there's quite a lot of people talked about the lack of courage in risk taking among activists now. And that wasn't like abusing off, sometimes it's seen as older generation activists abusing younger generation activists, oh, you know, you're not brave enough, you didn't do what we did in 81 or whatever. It wasn't like that, it wasn't about that. It was actually criticizing ourselves, uh, everybody, like saying just on the left overall. There's a lack of courage in risk taking. Our organisations are fragile where they even exist and there's huge gaps. And that we don't put enough time into thinking and strategising and just this whole sense of desperation clinging to the life rafts. Um, yeah, getting there. Positive. Good work of the nascent left think tanks, the rise in activism, including among students, Occupy, some unions and AAAP. The mana experiment was seen with amazing respect, I found at the time. Respect across generations and on the radical left where I'm from, a growing willingness, willingness to work across old boundaries. And that's like between, between anarchists, communists and socialists, a growing willing to talk with each other and try and meld across, start to meld across, actually work together, which is quite extraordinary given the background for some of those people, including me. Um, big conclusions looking forward. Um, uh, for a lot of people on the, this is the transformational left now, for a lot of us there's a sense that we've got no place to call home. There's no party or movement or place where we both for ideolo in an ideological way and in an active practical way, there's no place to call home. And this was coming from quite a few different people and places. 
There's a need to become braver and rediscover the will to power or discover it for the first time that we can make change now. This big one with all these theoreticians sitting here, theory matters and there's a, a, there's a thirst to develop new and relevant theory for Aotearoa in 2000 and now and that a thoughtful left is a potent left, so that leads to the think tank, yes, <laughs> supported <laughs> across the left, but um, I really came to the conclusion that myself, this is how I think that really you can't have one pan left think tank, it's just impossible because the divide between social democratic and radical left is too deep, it's just too fundamental. Um, and the only, I'm only interested in the transformational one, but I also welcome any other part of the left social, and the other two main places, the social democratic and the green or ecological left. I think there's a place for three left think tanks, could be others, anything's possible. I'm only interested in the transformational one, um, but I just can't see a pan left think tank as being possible. A think tank, will own, a transformational left think tank or any other kind will only happen if some individuals decide to go for it as a group and make it visible and possible. Union and community activists need to keep sustaining and building creative, effective organisations because a think tank will never work if it's in isolation from the activist left. Um, a big one for me, the left in Aotearoa actually is much bigger than I ever realised and I'd, I'd been in it all my life. And this is very, very exciting and I see all the people here I don't know, I'm just finding you. This is what keeps happening. We keep finding each other. And we have to nourish our will to power. Oh, and then I've got ideas about across the divide. Oh, Sorry, yeah. I'm going so fast. <laughs> um, in social movement research, I think to keep exploring actively our intersections between theory and practice, I found oh, Campbell's presentation was difficult but so stimulating. I just so many ideas came out of it, and it's in this area about learning from each other across theory and practice, um, in ways in which we might could some of us together or separately start to reframe the way social movement theory and research is done in Aotearoa, so that it does start to overcome some of the things. If, if anyone cares. Um, to start to rework and reframe, and Sandra coming up to Kotari, like that was just such a small but potent example of that. <clears throat> and of course, a, th a major left think tank on the radical left um, could also create a really cool space for this to happen, where we could work together um, with the interests of both the academy and of activists in mind. And I'd love to see, and this came through strongly from a lot of my research participants, um, a flowering of research into people's stories and histories of our groups and movements, the histories that haven't been told by social movement or university research. There's so much that hasn't been told and so much that can be learnt um, by people who are grounded in the sort of theories that a lot of us share, Marxist, Freerian, feminist, and, and so on. Um, for some of us, we've been actually working with that action, reflection, praxis all our lives on the ground. We have learnt so much, but we are not sharing and telling those stories, among other things that need to be shared. So let's take any opportunity we can to cross the Great Divide. And thank you so much for this weekend, this, these two days. And if you'd like to be part or interested in that Think Tech project, get a hold of me. There's my email. That's it. Kia ora.